Hello. Nice to meet you. Oh. Okay. No. Don't get over overexcited, please. <laughs> I'm not promising anything. And I, I sincerely can't believe they actually approved the talk. So I, I even prepared some slides because, you know, it's a serious game development conference. And what I wanted to talk about is that uh, I love making games. And mainly because making uh, games is, is easy. It's very, very, very easy. Uh, yeah, it's easy. Uh, you laugh, but, you know, ask any gamer on the internet and they will explain it to you how easy it is to do your job. Yeah. Of course, I'm joking. Don't talk to gamers on the internet because, you know, self-care is important. But I love making games. I, I love the industry, the creative energy, the, the people, and, you know, the small perks of game dev. Uh, my, my friend working in a serious suit and tie corporation asked me once how it was to work in an industry without a dress code. Without a dress code? No, no dress code? Don't, don't you see the hoodie? <laughs> but I'm not a fan of dress codes, but I just love hoodies. They are, you know, soft, warm, very nice to touch. And at, at least from my experience, you get them for, for free. <laughs> in, in any color you want, so long as it is black. <laughs> so, so life hack, get fired and hired from, you know, a few game studios and you will never have to buy a hoodie again. So, you know, I love hoodies because you can, you can put your headset on, draw the hood over your head, hunch over the desk, focus, and no one will bother you because you won't be able to hear them and they won't be able to make eye contact with you and this worked for me every time. It's, it's a nice coincidence that the clothing of choice in our industry is something that is nice, soft, very nice to touch, warm, that helps to hyperfocus and promotes antisocial behavior. <laughs> like neurodivergent match. Okay, who can sympathize? Well, the rest of you, don't worry, you will get your diagnosis yet. <laughs> and a side note, have you noticed how, how many of us in game dev have really cool special interests, like, I don't know, painting figurines, baking special pastries, uh, foraging, airsoft guns, uh, fencing. But I, I think it's, it's, it's really, it's cool. And speaking of autism, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was talking with a friend, friend once about books, and she said that she, she didn't read books for, for the story or, or, the, or the setting, that she was only interested in, in characters, relations, and emotions. Because that's how, he, how, how she should learn about normal human interactions. And by, by reading books. And, and you know, I, I could totally relate. Because I also learned everything about humans and the expected social behavior from a book. And the book was called the Lord of the Rings. Okay, you may laugh, but I'm telling you, The Lord of the Rings is the one book you need to read to learn how to survive making a game. Because, bear with me, it usually goes like, like this. You are just, let's say, a humble designer living your comfortable little life in your comfortable little hole in the ground. And you know, and, and life is good. And, and suddenly, your lead drops by. You know, a wise figure, uh, a mentor figure, very experienced and old. Uh, given the turnover rate in the industry, let's say he's 36. So, so you know, <laughs> ancient. He looks around, looks at one of your ideas and gasps. <gasps> this is the one. 
the one idea to rule them all and in the gameplay bind them. And you, you are the chosen one. You just have to sneak to Mordor and drop the idea into the build before the producers and the management notice. <laughs> be because if the management learned of the idea, they would grab it and bloat it and feature creep would spill all over the studio and the game as we know would be over. <laughs> so, so, okay, an adventure. You sneak to the, you know, uh, hidden conference room for the last friendly kickoff before the wilds of the production. Um, a side note, this part would be easier if you are a basic Lord of the Rings nerd, but I think in this population, you know, <laughs> the rest of you just, you know, laugh, laugh along. So, so <laughs> the last friendly kickoff, you, you, are, all, you are all, you know, hyped and, and excited. It's all, you have my art and my coat and, and you, f you form a, a, f a strike team, a, a fellowship even, and embark upon the adventure. Fast forward to the deep, dark mines of Crunch, where you lose your mentor. He, he faces the primordial demon of backlog. You know, <laughs> thou shalt not pass. And he plunges into the abyss of burnout. Like, test, you fools. <laughs> The road is not easy, you know, there are moments of, of triumph and, and betrayal. There are shortcuts that only make the way longer and there are nefarious schemes and, and epic battles, or at least creative disagreements. But, but you go on. And then after a time, your lead comes back from his sick leave and he has totally reinvented himself. He has, <laughs> he has bright new ideas. So, you know, most of the team is sideswept to deal with, with a dumpster fire, um, a side quest in, in another department. And they live through many an epic adventure. And, and suddenly, you are alone. Just you and your best buddy from the QA. And this weird, resentful guy who's been working here like since forever, and he always mumbles to himself that he had the same idea back in 1994, but nobody listens. <laughs> it is scary. Do you continue? Of course you do. Because of the sunken cost fallacy. You've sacrificed too much to give up now. And the idea... It is precious to you. <laughs> so you crunch on. You find a dark, secret path through the mountains of Feature Lock. And you sneak night after night through the ashen plains of the Beta. And finally, you reach Mount Build, where in the cracks of destiny, you have to submit your idea. But you can't. The idea is not ready. You need just just a little more time, just one more iteration. Oh, my precious idea. And as you hesitate, the producers notice what's going on and rush to stop you. And the fiery, lidless eye of the management turns its gaze upon you and you are exposed and all seems to be lost. And then, in a totally predictable turn of events, the creepy resentful guy steals your idea and submits it as his own. <laughs> Just before the build is cooked. Uh, and the idea goes into the build and, and it really ties the game together. The management is furious, but helpless. The, the creepy guy gets fired, of course. But you, you can come home to your hole in the ground, a hero. Wiser, perhaps. We, we all know the story. H happened to every one of us? Twice? <laughs> so, I'm telling you, <clears throat> read Lord of the Rings to know everything you must know about making a game. It makes you a good employee. You learn to listen to your elders, 
to sacrifice your life for the project. <laughs> it it te teaches you that you shouldn't be overly transparent with the production, that you know, information management is important. And it shows you that ownership and authorship of an idea is a social construct. <laughs> and sometimes, for the good of the project, uh, someone has to misappropriate your work. So it teaches you that <sighs> Mr. Buggins flying on the eagles is for the management. <laughs> you can go on foot. Come on, come on, come on, little hobbits, we can do it. So, you know, read Lord of the Rings and you can become the most obedient drone in an environment as toxic as the ashen plains of Mordor. It got too dark too quickly. I, I apologize. I, I'm probably overcompensating for something that might have happened to me at totally unspecified point in the past. <coughs> the Witcher. <coughs> <laughs> but... But, you know, that was a joke. Because, because, because the real morale from the Lord of the Rings is the following. There are no women. <laughs> I mean, there are some in the back office and those, this, this one diversity hire who wears hoodie li like a man and proves surprisingly competent at her work, but everyone dismiss dismisses it anyway because, you know, women. And I'm sorry, that is the state of the industry. And look at the players. A new cool game comes out and suddenly all the internet is like, waiter, uh, ex excuse me, waiter, there's a woman in my entertainment. <laughs> because gamers can be very particular about their entertainment, and I get it. They, they just want their games to be realistic and unpolitical, right? And let's take realism. I mean, visual fidelity. I'm truly amazed every day how much the state of the industry progressed. Because when I started making games, the bar was set really low, judging by today's, today's standards. You know, it was okay and enough if the main character wasn't too angular, like too square looking, he could be edgy. That was okay. And, and now? Now you can render the, the, the tiniest hair on the character's cheek. And yet, and yet, you render the tiniest hair on the cheek of a cheek, and suddenly the internet explodes. I, I'm talking, of course, about Alloy from, from the Horizon series. We want our games to be realistic. Alloy. But not like that. The, the hair is disgusting. I, I agree, nothing says realism like, you know, post-apocalyptic, tribal, new stone age with laser hair removal. <laughs> and it's always like this, you know, horse balls shrinking in the cold, the pinnacle of craftsmanship and, and the most um, admirable dedication to realism. Female characters with different body types. Outrage. <laughs> because say the gamers, it's not the question of realism. We just don't want our games to be political. I, I get you. So we must hate games about brave white Americans shooting people of color for the good of the Western world. <laughs> no, those games are okay. Ah, you must be talking about the games showing how for minorities and um, immigrants, the only way of social advancement is through criminal structures. No, Grand Theft Auto is a fine game. Okay, okay. so you must be talking about games romanticizing the land grab and genocide that laid foundation for today's America. What are you talking about, man? Red Dead Redemption is not political. <laughs> I'm maybe a bit lost. So, so uh, what political games are you talking about? What, what is political? Women and, and gay people 
inserted into our entertainment for no reason at all. That's political and unrealistic. That's woke agenda and will this oppression ever end? <laughs> and I know, I know what you want to say, that I should take a break from social media. Because self-care is important. <laughs> and I agree. But you can't really hide from those opinions. Because we got an email a few days ago at the company. It went like this. Gentlemen, I'm writing to you as a player. And to give you full context, I do have a wife. My wife, <laughs> my wife is a feminist. And I think of myself as a feminist as well. But can't you make a normal game with, with a male protagonist? I love and respect women, but women as main characters in games just don't work. It's not realistic, I guess. Best regards, blah, blah, blah. N not realistic. You know, I have a friend, and she is a, a real person who does exist. And, uh, and, and the information I'm about to give you is factually correct, and this is important for the joke to work. It, it's really true. So, she is an ex-model, a tall, beautiful woman with long, blonde hair. She has PhD in some complicated specialty, I don't know, uh, genetics or molecular chemistry uh, from Oxford University. She is a qualified coroner and she fences historical European martial arts, side sword, uh, long sword and rapier. Uh, she wins on a regular basis international fencing contests. She runs her own fencing school. And if you are in this kind of fandom, she is a blood princess recognized by some of the European aristocracy. I mean, who wrote her? <laughs> An ex-model sword fighting, Princess Doctor from Oxford. <laughs> a classic Mary Sue if I ever saw one. <laughs> but what I mean is that there's so many of us humans and we are so very different. And so many of us would make a kick-ass inspiration for a video game character. You know, not everything interesting has to happen to straight white guys. I am a straight white guy myself, and let me tell you, not many interesting things happen to me. <laughs> but that's exactly the problem I hear. Our straight, white, male life sucks. And we need those strong, fit, sexy, muscular heroes, no homo, <laughs> to escape the drudgery of our daily existence. I get it. But what about the other? What's, what's life, life like for, for women or the LGBT community in Poland nowadays, or, or in the US, or <laughs> rainbows and unicorns? So the others also need and deserve their power fantasies, because self-care is important. And yeah. Sorry. And I, I like games where the main character is someone very different from me. Because this exposes me to a wider range of ideas and concepts. I can see the world from a different point of view. And this is how I learn about the world. But maybe that's just autism. Because when you press the hypothetical uh, vocal gamer on the internet, and I don't like doing that, it's too much like pressing a ripe pimple. But when you press him, you soon learn what the problem really is. Eloy is fat and ugly, and I would never fuck her. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for sharing with the class. And <laughs> congratulations on your self-esteem, because when I imagine an intimate moment with Eloy, let's assume for the sake of the discussion that she were into men at all. The thing that pops to my head is, would Eloy fuck me? <laughs> I know, 
those pudding arms and the stamina that it makes me sweat if I take two flights, flights of stairs and this constant middle anxiety could be very sexy to someone somewhere, but Eloy, I might not be in her league. Uh, you know, you may ask, why am I obsessing about what some randos on the internet say? Because self-care is important, hashtag not all gamers. That's true. But <laughs> we were talking around in a group of friends slash colleagues the other day, all game developers, many years of experience and lots of you know, knowledge. And, and suddenly one of the guys posed this argument, this is bad design, she's not fuckable enough. <laughs> fuckable. Well, a, a, a quick disclaimer. You may ask if I am in the right position to talk about the representation of women in games. Don't I have too many penises to have the moral right to take the stand? I might have. But at the same time, hearing fuckability as an argument about game design just pisses me off. It, 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 I think it's a shitty way of talking about how games should be made, in my opinion, in my opinion. And let, let me explain. It's not about not wanting or not liking sex or, or being a prude, because sex is okay. And then sexual fantasies are okay. Who of us at some point of life didn't fantasize about bunch of textured polygons. <laughs> I know I have. No judgment on my side. Which reminds me of a domestic scene. What are you doing in front of the computer so late at night? My dear husband. Oh, I'm just playing a video game, dear wife of mine. <laughs> have fun. And I'm I hope you're not fucking Yennefer, that woman is toxic. <laughs> so, you know, no judgment on my side. Uh, if it were to me, we could all just go home and rub one out to the fictional character of our choice. And, because self-care is important, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the other way around, it's, it's totally okay for me to say that I would never have sex with that fictional character, or another. You know, intimacy and sexual fantasies are something very personal, and not everyone has a thing for uh, Pikachu. <laughs> so, some do. No judgment here. Curiosity? Yes. Anyway, anyway, it's only human to be turned on or off by fictional characters. That's okay. But, but if I say that female character is not fuckable enough, I think I'm not being a good designer, I'm being a dick. Because I think with my dick, and I uh, put my preferences and sexual fantasies over the consistency of my design. Aha! Someone might say, so you hate strong, sexy women. And, and someone, in fact, did say that because that was lately my favorite uh, topic to argue with people on the internet. So how, how, how could I respond to such piercing criticism? Well, uh, if the sexiness is in line and in sync with, with the character, the, the world, the tone of the game, it's okay. Great design. Mm, om nom nom. I, I love well-written sex scenes, ma mainly because somewhat has already written the dialogue for me. <laughs> My personal skills when it comes to sexy talk are like, more, you know, Henry Dubois from Disco Elysium. <laughs> you know, glorious failure. <laughs> so, I love well-written sex scenes. But what I have problem with is when a guy, usually a lead or someone from the management, comes in and says, hmm, not fuckable enough. And suddenly, everyone starts scrambling around, adding fuckability. 
been then, been there, done that, got all the Witcher sex cards. <laughs> hmm? Great feature. The pinnacle of game design. I so look forward to seeing them in 4K or, or 3D in the upcoming The Witcher remake. <laughs> or, or take a look at Siri. You know, she is a Witcher, trained to be a warrior since she was but a little girl. She can fight blindfolded based on her hearing alone. You know, you can imagine how people with such a background move, you know, like, like snakes or, or coiled springs, you know, emanating this silent threat. You know, just, just by their posture alone, you can understand that they are warriors, deadly warriors. And probably that's why Ciri in Witcher 3 runs like this. On her high heels, with those tiny little steps, like 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 a model on a runway, <laughs> I wanted to shout, "Siri, drop the act! You are in the middle of a forest. Nobody's looking." <laughs> Sorry, mate, she would reply. The creative director is always looking. <laughs> Bes besides, that's my approved fuckability level. What about the target group? What inevitably someone says. What about those poor boys whose sexual fantasies and frustrations we would like to exploit <laughs> for the greater good? <laughs> which is the satisfaction of our shareholders. <laughs> well, those poor boys have Pornhub, they will manage, don't you worry about them. But, but they are right, the target group, half of the players are male. <laughs> that means, of course, that the other half are female, and yet I don't see such care put into de designing suitably fuckable male characters. Can you imagine the creative director comes in looks at, I don't know, Geralt's new model, runs him around a bit and says, not fuckable enough, increase fuckability. <laughs> and suddenly, a, a programmer spends two weeks polishing the physics of Geralt buttocks. <laughs> or, or in the making of, the audio department explains how they used raw chicken breast and a wooden ruler to simulate the sound of Geralt's ass cheek slapping together as he rides a horse. <laughs> but credit where credit's due, things are getting better. The second witcher started with a naked lady, and the third witcher started with an iconic shot of a naked man in a bathtub. Yeah? Uh, but, but the mic drop in the area of blood and sexualization of the male form belong to someone else. Bear with me. Bear, bear with me. Yeah, I'm talking about Baldur Gate 3 and, you know, those soft porn-like shots of the male butts and, and not so subtle glimpses of the penis. Um, and did you notice that no one had a problem that it was gay sex? All the fragile men were too distracted by the bear with a heavily implied erection. You know, paint me like one of your French bears. <laughs> because being gay is clearly political. But shagging a bear <laughs> happens to the best of us. <laughs> you know, how was it? Is smiešno i strašno. <laughs> but never mind, I have a perfect solution for, for all of this. Why don't we add fuckability to accessibility options? Like, I, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I start a game. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I start a game and, and be like, uh, mouse inverted, 
Audi FX, uh, Blow, Fuckability, Brand of Tarth. <laughs> Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> because I like my female protagonists, like my game production. Messed up and on fire. <laughs> because, switching the topic, this is what most people don't get. How messy the actual game production really is. You know, I was once living uh, in a place that had a, a trash gazebo. You know, one of those little buildings where you store all the, all the dumpsters. And this particular gazebo didn't have doors. So people from all around the neighborhood were just dropping the trash there. And, and then stray dogs and crows had a feast. And, and, and it was a disaster. And one day, when I was taking out the trash, I stumbled upon a homeless guy rummaging through the stuff. He looked at me, clearly upset and exasperated, and said, What's wrong with you? This place is a fucking mess. <laughs> and I thought, you're right, you're right, but you clearly haven't seen the Witcher Quest structure a day before the release. <laughs> That's what people don't get. How, how messy a game production is. They always write in, on the internet, oh, this game was shitty, and they were greedy, and they clearly removed something from the game for the DLCs. Like, we had any choice on that. Like, you know, we all know that game production is a force of nature. And at some point, it's both unmanageable and unstoppable. And, and fighting with it is like, you know, pissing against a tornado. Yeah? And, you know, nobody wants to make a shitty game. What they imagine that we have a shittification department that comes in <laughs> after the beta to find the most cost-effective way of fucking up the experience. Like, let's add a pixelated texture here, maybe some mistranslated dialogues there, and let's do a special mock-up session for those fucked up animations. Like, <laughs> like, no one wants to make a shitty game, it just happens. I told this to a friend who worked on a game that received you know, less than stellar reviews, and they said, Nah, we knew the game was shit. We just, we just didn't care anymore. The boss was such a dick that, that we lost the heart and the ability to, to care. So that's probably the, the other option, but it never happens, right? I don't understand why you are laughing. It was not supposed to be a joke because the management clearly earns so much money that they must know how to motivate people and how to plan a successful production. Duh. <laughs> and we ho have all those, you know, new methodologies, design thinking and agile and... <laughs> yeah? You know, personally, I, I love good comedy, so when I first heard about Scrum, I was overjoyed. <laughs> but, but let me tell you, the first stand -up, daily stand-up meeting, huge disappointment. I was the only one who prepared anything funny. But yeah, looking back, looking back, the schedule was a joke. Because, <clears throat> you know, because making games is easy. But removing something <laughs> from a newly finished game, well, <laughs> why, why would I do that? Like, why would I remove something that finally worked? Like, it, it, it would be like, like I'm doing a miracle. Like, like, I don't know, asking Christ to bring Lazarus back to life and then... <laughs> Can you do it again? Besides, have you ever tried to remove something from a nearly finished game? Like, it's like dumpster diving, right? You know what I'm talking about. No? no. Uh, let's say you're working on your new special interest. Uh, you take off the wedding ring so it wouldn't get lost. Then you take out the trash, you clean up. 
and you couldn't find the ring. And you start panicking because you know what's just happened. You run outside, climb into the dumpster, try to, <laughs> trying to find your, your, your bag of trash, and, and suddenly a, a thought strikes you. I'm looking for the one ring in, in the darkest of places. I am not the hero. <laughs> I'm Gollum. <laughs> Damn, that's an idea. A game about Gollum. That, that would be a kill... <laughs> That could be a killer franchise. Anyway, anyway, anyway. You surface to get some air and find yourself eye to eye with your neighbor. You don't even explain. You just grab your bag. In fact, you grab two bags because they look the same and run upstairs. You drop them into the bathtub because they are sipping the tra trash juice. You, you know, trash juice. It, it looks like very strong Earl Grey tea and and smells like something completely different. So yeah. anyway, you open a bag, it's not yours, and suddenly you, you get this strange glimpse into private lives on your neighbors. It's like, oh, hmm. Yeah. You open your bag. Luckily, there are chopsticks there from the Chinese the other day because you don't have rubber gloves. Like, who am I, a serial killer? And you sift through the trash, but the ring is not there. So you, ad you admit your defeat, take the trash out again, take a shower, thinking how you to tell the wife that you've lost the one ring. You won't be using the bathtub for some time because you know self-care <laughs> is important. When you put on the trousers, you find the ring in this condom pocket because you put it there so it wouldn't be lost. And Removing content from a newly finished game is exactly like that. But the dumpster is on fire. <laughs> and you are in hell. <laughs> we all know how it is. You know, I'm talking about the last moments before the release when the temperature is so high, as high as, as, as the molten lava in the cracks of destiny, or as high as the roaring flames in the dumpster of fire. You know, just this, this exciting and demanding short time when you crunch a bit, but for a good reason, you know, those last few, you know, years of the production. <laughs> I know, I know, hashtag, not all studios. <laughs> for me, like the ratio was 50-50, like half of the studios I worked for crunched, the, the bigger half. I mean, the bigger studios with, with the bigger project, because, you know, making games is easy. Yeah. And you don't have to explain it to me. I, I know that a game production is a complicated process with lots of moving parts, aka a dumpster on fire. And I know that we, the creators, are very passionate creatures that are okay with spending a weekend or two working just to make sure that the game comes out on time. But I'm not talking about an occasional weekend. I am talking about planning for crunch because it seems to me that some companies do just that. You know, when you make your first game and you crunch, that's probably lack, lack of experience. When you make your second game and you crunch, you can probably blame it on bad luck. But when you are crunching on your third game, usually that takes some planning. And on a totally you know, unrelated note, an anecdote. When I was working on the first Witcher, uh, <laughs> there was a moment when we, the, the, the designers, were sitting uh, in a room with some guys from the QA. And one evening, one of the QA guys were playing with this plastic sword. He was sitting on a chair and, and rolling on the chair a bit and, and had this really focused expression, like he was solving some very complex mathematical problem in his head. Like, And I asked, what's up? And he said, oh no, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the easiest way to kill all designers in one go. <laughs> We just, you know, shrugged. The guy was living, sleeping under the desk six nights 
a week for a month, like he deserved some entertainment. You know, <laughs> self-care is important. And, and at least we knew he were living in the studio because <laughs> there was this other guy uh, who, you know, you know, he had to do it because he was moving from one flat to another and, and there was some mix up with the schedule and he had nowhere to go. So he moved in, he moved in the studio and nobody noticed <laughs> because there was always someone, you know, sleeping on the couch in the conference room or staying late at night in front of the computer to catch up with the work or, or going out of the, of the shower in the morning. A guy lived in the studio for two weeks and nobody noticed. A true story. <clears throat> because, you know, I, I see a trend with, when it comes to big game companies all over the world. They promise they will not crunch. And they keep that promise until there is a game to be finished and released. <laughs> then they crunch. And someone learns about it, a journalist, and writes an article about it. And, and there's a scandal and the company promises never to crunch again. And they keep that promise until there is a game to be finished and released. Then they crunch and someone writes about it, like saying, that they've broken their promise, so, so they apologize to the players <laughs> and promise never to crunch again. Besides, says the management, it was a voluntary crunch. You could choose if you wanted to work on Saturday or on Sunday. <laughs> Besides, besides, says the management, it was the team's individual decision to crunch. We just communicated the release date, which couldn't be postponed, and the scope of the project, which couldn't be cropped in any way. And based on that information, the team decided to crunch. <laughs> Personally, says the management, we are strictly against crunch. <laughs> Self-care is important. So they promise never to crunch again, and they keep that promise until there's a game to be finished and released. You know, you may say that I am jaded, but this is just how mm, abusive relationships and codependency, codependency work. Like, you know, daddy promises never to drink again. <laughs> and everyone hopes he won't. And for some time, he doesn't, but then he does. And everyone is heartbroken and disillusioned. But what were they expecting if daddy didn't go to therapy and made no other lifestyle changes? And to go to therapy, you need to acknowledge you have a problem. And if I asked a hypothetical CEO of a big game company, he would say, dude, I don't have a problem. I have a Ferrari <laughs> and a summer house on Costa del Sol. And that's just what I've bought this month because self-care is important. <laughs> so personally, I wouldn't be holding my breath. And another Lord of the Rings reference, sometimes people from the management are like, like those old elves, you know, all uh, good uh, intentions and, and calculated fr friendliness, like you are the one going to Mordor. But at least Galadriel will bring you swag from the conference you didn't have time to attend. Or El Elrond will pay for the midnight pizza. <laughs> and I hope that this management style is also a relic of a time soon to be gone. A boy can dream. But I still love making games because making games is easy. What's hard is 
finishing games. <laughs> because it's never like the right moment to stop. There is always this one bug to fix, this one idea to try, this one feature to polish. It's, 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 it's like the scene in a horror movie when the character tries to escape and, and runs through this endless corridor. And, and the faster they run, the faster the, the exit moves away. It feels exactly like this. The, the more I work on a nearly finished game, the faster the content log moves away. And after all those years in the industry, I start thinking that sometimes I might be the problem because maybe the end of the project is not you know, the best time for testing new ideas. And, and maybe, maybe there is this, this fine line between pushing for quality and feature creep. And maybe sometimes it is okay to decide that this idea could wait for an update. But it really feels that way. Because what it feels like is that I have found the one idea and it is precious to me. And I just have to sneak to Mordor and push it into cracks of destiny into Mount Build before the produ pro producers notice. So I keep staying overnight and, and sometimes someone finds me and asks, what are you doing? Uh, you know, I have this idea and it is precious to me. <laughs> yeah, but what are you doing? Uh, I told you I'm working on a brilliant idea of mine. Yeah, but what are you doing? I told you I'm saving the project. I'm the hero. Yes, but what it is exactly that you are doing at this moment? Oh, oh, I'm just, I'm just pouring gasoline into the dumpster. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, I don't have any, you know, any more jokes, so, so I'll just tell that uh, Polish game dev is unionizing and you can scan the QR code. <laughs> thank you, thank you.